Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Yashodanandana prajajana ranjana Yashodanandana prajajana ranjana Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Chaitanya Chaitanya Amrita Adilla chapter 7, verse 1. Agatya ek gatim natva He nartha dhik sadhakam Shri Chaitanyam likhyate asya Prema bhakti vadanyata Agatya ek gatim natva He nartha dhik sadhakam Shri Chaitanyam likhyate asya Prema bhakti vadanyata Agatya ek gatim natva 
ಹೀನಾಕೈತನ್ಯಂ ಲಿಖ್ಯತೆ ಪ್ರೇಮ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವದಾನ್ಯತ ಗತಿ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಫಾಲನ್ ಏಕ ದಿ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಒನ್ ಗತಿಂ ಡೆಸ್ಟಿನೇಷನ್ ನತ್ವಾ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ರಿಂಗ್ ಒಬೇಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಹೀನ ಇನ್ಫೀರಿಯರ್ ಅರ್ಥ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಅಧಿಕ ಗ್ರೇಟರ್ ದೆನ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಸಾಧಕ ಹೂ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ರೆಂಡರ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಅಂಟು ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಲಿಖ್ಯತೆ ಇಸ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ರಿಟನ್ ಅಸ್ಯ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು ಪ್ರೇಮ ಲವ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಡಿವೋಷನಲ್ ಸರ್ವಿಸ್ ವದಾನ್ಯತ ಮೆಗ್ನಾನಿಮಿಟಿ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಪರ್ಪೋರ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಹಿಸ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಗ್ರೇಸ್ ಎ ಸಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಶ್ರೀಲತ್ತಗೋಪಾಲ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಮಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫರ್ ಮೈ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ಫುಲ್ ಅಬೀಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟು ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು who is the ultimate goal of life for one bereft of all possessions in this material world and is the only meaning for one advancing in spiritual life thus let me write about his magnanimous contribution of devotional service in love of god a person in the condition stage of material existence is in an atmosphere help of helplessness but the conditioned soul under the illusion of maya or the external energy thinks that he is completely protected by his country society friendship and love not knowing that at the time of death none of these can save him the laws of material nature are so strong that none of our material possessions can save us from the cruel hands of death in the bhagavad gita 39 it is stated janma mrityu jara vyadhi dukha dosha nadarshanam one who is actually advancing must always consider the four principles of miserable life 
namely birth, death, old age and disease. One cannot be saved from all these miseries unless he takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is therefore the only shelter for all conditioned souls. An intelligent person therefore does not put his faith in any material possessions but completely takes shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Such a person is called Akinchana or one who does not possess anything in this material world. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is also known as Akinchana Gochara for he can ach be achieved by a person who does not put his faith in material possessions. Therefore, for the fully surrendered soul who has no material possessions on which to depend, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the only shelter. Everyone depends on dharma, religiosity, artha, economic development, karma, sense gratification, and ultimately moksha salvation. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, due to his magnanimous character, can give more than salvation. Therefore, in this verse, the words Heen Artha Dhika Sadhakam indicate that although by material estimation, salvation is of a quality superior to the inferior interests of religiosity, economic development and sense gratification. Above salvation, there is the position of devotional service <coughs> and transcendental love for the Supreme Personality of God. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the bestower of these, this great benediction. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Prema Pumartho Mahan. Love of Godhead is the ultimate benediction for all human beings. Sri Krishna, Krishna Das Kviraj Goswami, the author of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, therefore, first offers his respectful obeisances unto Lord, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu before describing his magnanimity in bestowing love of Godhead. Om Ajnanati Mirandhasya Jnananjani Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Aschatya Desha Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Bhascha Kripa Sindhu Bhavacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna so I'm grateful to be here with all of you today and when we are celebrating the auspicious appearance of Mahaprabhu the occasion is two days later, but logistics sometimes come in the way of our celebrations. Logistics sometimes gives the opportunity to expand our celebrations. So when the festival is on a weekday, we forget to celebrate on the weekend as well as a weekday. So today, I'll speak on the concept of mercy and how Mahaprabhu manifests his mercy. Now, this is the Chaitanya Charitamrita which we are discussing. And the Chaitanya Charitamrita has a very interesting structure in how it glorifies Mahaprabhu. So, Chaitanya Charitamrita actually, in one sense, the sorry, the the first lila, the Adi lila, has a certain number of chapters. Here we have 19 chapters. The actual lila begins from the 13th chapter onwards. And before that, till this chapter, the tattva is described. The various aspects of tattva. And then after that, in the next few chapters, the vamsya, the lineages are described. Who are the authorized followers of Mahaprabhu? The Nityananda vamsya, the Advaita vamsya, like that. So this chapter marks the transition from, you could say, philosophy to history. Before this, philosophy is being described. Then the historical lineages will be described. That's how 
Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami describe his authority in writing Chaitanya Charita Amrit. What gives him the authority to write? And then from chapter 13, he'll start the pastime with the appearance of Mahaprabhu. And in this particular verse, he is talking about Mahaprabhu in two different ways. He's glorifying him. Vadanyata. Vadanyata is the magnanimity, the generosity. So that magnanimity, he's talking about it two ways. First he says is that for those who have who have who are bereft of material possessions, for those who are bereft of material possessions, Mahaprabhu is the shelter. Agatya Gatim. Agatya means those who gati, see gati in Sanskrit means motion as well as destination. We have motion when we want to go towards some destination. But sometimes life puts us in a situation where we just feel nothing is worthwhile. Why should I do anything at all? So agatya gatim. So for those who have lost all hope in life. It's not just hope in spiritual life. Sometimes people lose hope in material life also. No, why have a job? Why pursue a relationship? Why even live at all? So, for those who have lost any sense of destination, he becomes their destination. Okay. He is the he is the destination for the destinationless. So, those who have no destination, they, they may feel that there's no point to live and then they will be given that point by Mahaprabhu. And for those who have a destination, heen artha dikasadhanakam, that those who have a destination, for them he reveals himself as the highest destination. So, highest destination for those pursuing various destinations. And in the purport, Shri Prabhupada talks about the general broad destinations that people have in life. That is Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. Now Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha, these are four broad categories of goals that people have. So dharma is sometimes translated as religion. But dharma also means virtue. There are many people who seek virtue in life. They want to live virtuously. I want to be kind. I want to be truthful. I want to be helpful. There are people who are charitable. So there are some people who pursue this. There are some people who pursue artha. Artha can simply mean money, but it can also mean prosperity. So prosperity can mean various things. Now karma can mean sensual gratification, but karma can also mean satisfaction of desires. Now, we all have various desires, and when our desires are satisfied, then we feel satisfied to some extent. So this is satisfaction. And then moksha, moksha is liberation. As Prabhupada uses the word salvation. Now, f philosophically speaking, salvation, the word is used more in the Christian sense. And their idea is that we go to heaven and we stay there forever. But the idea is that we are, we are freed from this world. So salvation or liberation, whatever word we use. Different people may have these four goals in different ways. So some people may just seek you know, I want financial security. I want a stable family life. I, everybody wants these things, but different people want these things to different degrees. And when somebody doesn't get one of these or two of these or three of these, they start thinking, what is the point even of living? So here he's talking about the inclusiveness of Mahaprabhu's mercy. That if you, if you are hopeless, if you have nothing to live for, Mahaprabhu will become the purpose for living. And if you have something to live for, Mahaprabhu will reveal you how there is something bigger that you can live for. In this way, Mahaprabhu's mercy can encompass everyone. Right from those who may be fallen, those who may be goalless, to those who are elevated, those who are living a life of value, they can find a life of greater value. And not greater, the supreme value. So in that sense, 
mercy, while well, it can mean many things. Sometimes you may say, oh, it's my... It's mercy that I got the association of this senior devotee, or it's mercy that I got to go to Vrindavan. It's my mercy that I even came to give the God the opportunity to practice bhakti. Well, all these are true. So mercy, in it can have two different senses to it. Mercy at one level means the opportunity to get something more than what we deserve. Generally, mercy is the idea that it's not proportional it's not merited that it's we the opportunity to get something more than we deserve that's one aspect of mercy mm -hmm. so whatever karma we may have done in the past we may not have much spiritual interest we may not have much spiritual credits but still we get the opportunity to connect with krishna so opportunity to get more than what we deserve. But mercy has another <coughs> equally important aspect. And that is the, the capacity to value something higher than what we would normally value. Something higher than what we normally value. So this is actually the internal aspect of mercy. So when we, we all value some things in life. An alcoholic, for them the biggest value is a bottle of alcohol. They are ready to sacrifice anything just to get something to drink. Now, there was an anti-alcohol video I saw that how a person can become addicted. That this person is watching uh, TV with his family and on TV there is an ad. It says, the price of vodka has increased. Mm, so the son is fearfully asking his father, Dad, will you drink less now? The father says, no, you will eat less now. <laughs> <laughs> so it is more than one's children's sustenance, one thinks feeding one's own addiction. That is of the greatest value. So everybody has something that they value. In one fascinating purport, Prabhupada says that everybody has some God. And when you say that God, what it means? Whatever is the locus of highest value for a person, that is their God. So whatever is the thing that they value the most, that is their idea of God. They may not literally worship that. Some people even do that. But for some people it may be alcohol. For some people it may be money. For some people, it may be health. For some people, it may be their reputation. Different people have different things that they value. And in one sense, impurity, any kind of impurity is basically a misalignment between what we value and what is of value. Any impurity, what it does is, what it does is what we value. So a person who is greedy, they value positions over everything else. They may value positions about their reputation, they may value positions about their character, about their virtues, everything. So this misalignment, every impurity, what it does is, it creates a misalignment between what we value and what is of value. And purification essentially means the realignment between what we value and what is of value. So purification is a gradual incremental process. Where solely when we have attachments, generally every attachment means that we irrationally value something far more than its actual value. So that is the essence of attachment. There are many things are of value in life, but attachment means we value something far more than its actual value. And detachment means the willingness to let go of that. However, bhakti is not just about detachment. Bhakti is about attachment to Krishna. So there are many things of value in life. And when we are pure, that means that which is of the highest value, we accord it the highest value. So 
ultimately we are souls we have an eternal relationship with krishna and our relationship with krishna is of the highest value so when we learn to value that relationship with krishna the highest that is the state when we are pure yam labdhva cha aparam labham manyate nadikam tataha in the bhagavata krishna says when in the state of samadhi in the state of liberated awareness the yogi recognizes that there is no gain greater than this so now this process of changing what we value it is a very gradual incremental and often laboriously painful process but when we get mercy that mercy can change what we value in a dramatic way so in a dramatic way so generally suppose somebody has a bad habit and they want to give up a habit they want to give up alcoholism they try they can't give it up they try they can't give it up so their intelligence may understand that yeah you know this is just getting me into trouble i want to give it up but their mind keeps value you know this is important how can i live without it everything else i'm ready to give up for it so that change when it happens when they start when they give up give it up that means they start a sober life a responsible life my job my family my health i value those more and therefore i give this up so generally changing what we value requires a lot of effort but when we get mercy then what happens is the what we value can change dramatically so if we consider say the most valuable thing is there say it's our relationship with krishna and there are many things of value in life so we could go from like this till v9 v10 so whatever we are value for a child the toy may be the most valuable thing and the toy breaks like the end of the world for the child now we may laugh but actually for the child it's a catastrophe so that's what they are valuing so to even take one step upwards two step upwards or just one step from the previous one to the next each of these takes time so this is gradual purification whereas when we get mercy we can just it's like a elevator purification is gradually like one step one step we take we go by a staircase upwards but when we get mercy what we presently value and what we actually value, what is actual value there might be a huge distance between that but suddenly feel like this is what really matters in life so that is the mercy of mahaprabhu that when his magnanimity is what that whatever it is that we may be valuing presently which essentially determines the level of our consciousness the level of our life from there we can rise to the highest value by his mercy and in in terms of this par, this perspective or this visual you can say what is mahaprabhu this particular verse talking about the mercy the first point it's saying is that if say somebody is right over here at the bottom nothing is of value in life that what is the point even of living so agatya gatim natva right from here a person can be elevated to the place where they will realize that love for krishna living in a mood of service to krishna that is the highest value on the other hand somebody may be already at a elevated level dharma artha kama if somebody is pursuing virtue that's a person is a good thing if a person is pursuing uh, responsible responsible person is doing their job honorably respectably uh, then that is also a good thing if a person is taking care of their family properly that's also a good thing so but a person may already be elevated but from wherever they are from there also they already have a high goal in life relatively speaking but from there they can get the highest goal and even if somebody has liberation as their goal even that they will transcend so in the past time sarvabhutacharya it is krishnadas kavi yoshi me says that uh, that mahaprabhu liberated sarvabhauma from the clutches of liberation <laughs> so in the bhakti tradition when liberation is considered to be like a clutch it's like it's considered to be a trap because in liberation we may be free from distress but there is no experience of love there is no experience of 
the remembrance of Krishna, service to Krishna. And in that sense, even that is considered to be a deprivation. So he was liberated from liberation. That is the glorification of Kaivalya Nistarakau. In the Shad Goswami Ashtakam, it is Kaivalya is liberation. It's the highest destination of the yogis and the jnanis. But Nistarakau, they deliver people from liberation. You deliver people from material existence. Why deliver somebody from liberation? Because even liberation is something which deprives the soul of the highest experience the soul is capable of. And that is love for Krishna. So this is the essence of mercy. That what we value presently and what is of actual value, that huge distance that might be there, that is bridged by mercy. Now when we get association of devotees, when we get to go to a holy place, when we get the opportunity to practice bhakti, that is mercy in the sense that we get glimpses of what is of higher value. For, for people who have never encountered anyone, anyone spiritually minded, anyone who is say a saint or a monk or somebody who renounced the world, for them they have, they have no idea that there is something of higher value beyond this world. If they have heard vaguely about things, they think, oh, these people are just, uh, just foolish people. Maybe they are they're failures in life, they are escapists, they just run away from the world. They may think like that. But actually they meet with a saintly person and they realize, hey, this person has something of, this person is so satisfied, so enriched. When Shila Prabhupada met Ambarish Prabhu for the first time, Alfred Ford is the great grandson of Henry Ford. So the devotees in themselves, Amrish Prabhu is a very humble and sweet devotee. The devotees were in awe, oh, they were introducing Prabhupada. Prabhupada is a great grandson of Henry Ford. And Prabhupada met him and Prabhupada was graceful, but Prabhupada also grave. Prabhupada said, so, you are the great grandson of Henry Ford? He said, yes, Prabhupada. Where is he now? Now, so Amrish Prabhu said that when I heard this, what Prabhupada meant was that, okay, he accumulated all that wealth, but that wealth is left behind, he's gone somewhere else. Where is he now? What did he carry with him? He says, Prabhupada is a real saint. A real saint. Prabhupada is not here to flatter me to get some donation from me. Prabhupada is here to actually enlighten me. So what is of highest value? That, when we associate with saintly people, we are reminded of that. So if... If what we value does not change by association with devotees, by the practice of bhakti, then our, our association of devotees or even our practice of bhakti is actually very superficial. Somebody may come to a temple. One of my relatives, they came to the Jehu temple when I had just joined as a brahmachari. They had come to try to persuade me to not be a brahmachari. And then I was staying in one of the guest rooms at that time and then they tried to talk with me, they didn't listen. And then they, then after a couple of days they called me. And they said, you know, actually, uh, I thought they will be angry because if you come to persuade someone, that person doesn't listen to you, you may get angry with that person. I said, actually, our visit to the temple was very productive. I said, really? He said, we had just moved to a new house and we're thinking what kind of furniture to get. So we saw the furniture in the guest house and you're staying. We decided to get that kind of furniture. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, it's unfortunate that they didn't think of anything about Krishna. But at one level, that, so if we come to Krishna and we continue to keep valuing the things that we value, then also it's good because we are connecting with Krishna and gradual purification will occur. But that is bahunam janmanam ante. That may take many lifetimes. If you see, what is, what is the difference in 7th chapter Krishna talks about various kinds of people who approach him and then there are four kinds of people Krishna says who approach him. In Kali Yuga there are four kinds of people who approach him. Those who are distressed, those who are distressed, those who are distressed and those who are distressed. <laughs> <laughs> so, people come but what is the difference between those four categories mentioned in 7.16 and 7.19? The category Krishna calls as Mahatma. He says, Vasudeva Sarvamiti. The difference between those who come initially to Krishna and those who are considered Mahatmas is that for them Krishna becomes the highest value. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Now how does this change occur? 
So the first part I talked about is mercy. What is mercy? It's a change in our in in what we value. Then how does this change occur? And how does Mahaprabhu provide this change, or he stimulate or accelerate this change? So now generally this change occurs through broadly two things. There is intelligence. there is intelligence and then there is experience we can use our intelligence to understand okay what is of value but experience is where we where we ourselves either experience somebody who is in great joy or we ourselves experience some great joy great peace great fulfillment and that is what completely realigns our inner world so intelligence is more through the path of philosophy we use our in analysis we you we study philosophy mahaprabhu also says that or the chetan chetamut says that hearing is very important hearing like the food for the soul just as we have food for the body and experience comes by the practice of bhakti now philosophy is also part of bhakti but here specifically bhakti paresha anubhava virakti ranyatra cha when we practice bhakti then we get experience of krishna and par ish anubhav somebody may come to the temple but when they come to the temple they may just see oh, these are decorated dolls they don't experience krishna but if there is bhakti in the heart and say oh this is the this is the almighty lord this is this is the ultimate benedictor and protector of my life this is the person who is the ultimate purpose of my life so that bhakti gives us experience of krishna so with our intelligence we understand there is something of higher value but through the practice of bhakti we experience something of higher value and that keeps drawing us forward that keeps drawing us upward and now th this process of using our intelligence and seeking higher experience this is a time honored process but what mahaprabhu does is mahaprabhu by his mercy gives very advanced spiritual experiences to even people who are not very qualified generally the spiritual experiences they come rarely so when we talk about spiritual experiences it is across the across history and geography there are different religious traditions different theistic traditions different wisdom traditions they talk about people experiencing something higher but this spiritual experience it's almost like a black box you know what is inside it is like a mystery in some traditions in the sufis they have the darwishes people just keep whirling round and round and round and round and round like is it never to get exhausted what kind of energy do they have in the christian tradition sometimes people have these uh, they are the passion of the christ the word passion has different meaning for them passion is that when they meditate on jesus sacrifice when he was crucified the similar bodily marks come on their body so in the hindu tradition there are sometimes people who seem to get possessed by gods and goddesses and then they start dancing uh, wildly and they start uh, doing various kinds of things and at that time uh, sometimes uh, sometimes some people just start speaking in a different tongue start speaking in a different tone so there are experiences of the paranormal of something beyond the normal and these are often called as spiritual experiences now they may or may not be but the idea is people sometimes experience something different from the normal and now that is fine if somebody experiences something one time one devotee came to shri prabhupad and he said prabhupad krishna came in my dream yesterday and he was very excited he is not a devotee actually he is a life member he was a person he says he says prabhupad krishna came in my dream yesterday and Pra he was so excited prabhupad was completely nonchalant all right then serve him today <laughs> <laughs> so prabhupad focused not on the content of the experience but the impact of the experience anybody can claim krishna came in my dream 
anybody can claim that oh when i came to the temple krishna winked at me from the altar you know now is can krishna come in someone's dream can krishna wink at someone well, who can stop krishna from doing anything but who can stop anyone from claiming that krishna has done those things so the content is something which is which is like a mystery what is real what is not real that is very difficult to know but there are two things what we can know is the impact if somebody has actually experienced krishna what will happen is that they will start valuing krishna much more than anything else that they will be pursuing krishna wholeheartedly so we don't know what the content of spiritual experiences is this but we don't know what the impact is and if there is the impact you know prabhupad sometimes some devotees say that you know mahaprabhu would go into ecstasy so much but prabhupad didn't seem to go so much into ecstasy but prabhupad said that preaching was ecstasy and ecstasy is not just about how we experience joy ecstasy is about how we give krishna joy and when we give krishna joy naturally we also experience joy so for prabhupad as a missionary his focus was giving krishna joy by getting souls to come who were lost to come toward krishna and in that prabhupad experienced ecstasy the impact was even at a at an advanced stage prabhupad had more energy than his disciples who were often age of his grandchildren not just his children so that extraordinary energy that extraordinary dedication was the indication that prabhupad had some extraordinary higher experiences so the impact is what is manifested in terms of a person's life and then before that is the stimuli now we don't know what the internal of a spiritual experience is but we know we can say what are the external sources by which spiritual experiences can come so we come and behold the lord we hear his past time we participate in the kirtans we do his seva by all these we are showing krishna that krishna i value you you are important for me your service is important for me my mind may say do this do that do that but this is what is important for me and when we focus on that when we we in a systematic disciplined way focus on devotional stimuli that itself is an indication that we have started valuing krishna because why would somebody in a disciplined way keep practicing bhakti either either they are at least at, if uh, if they are not experiencing something directly at least at the level of intelligence they have started appreciating its value and then as long as we are exposing ourselves to devotional stimuli regularly the experiences the tran- the, the inner transformative experiences will come and then the impact will manifest the impact will manifest not just in ecstasy that breaks the normal routine of life it can also manifest in increased dedication to the service of krishna so what does Ma- so in terms of this we are again talking about mahaprabhu's mercy see mahaprabhu made the stimuli that give spiritual experience very richly available bhakti was already widely prevalent when mahaprabhu was there in india and bhakti is a part of the vedic literature but what mahaprabhu did was he made bhakti much much more accessible much much more easily available even the, if if you see in the traditional sri vaishnava or madhava vaishnava traditions kirtan is a performance that accompanies aarti if you go in south indian temples you'll see that there's a pujari doing aarti and there are some people who are singing along with it and everybody folds hands and watches so kirtan was a performance to be beheld just like when the person pujari on the altar is doing aarti it's not that everybody else also starts doing aarti no everybody else watches it so just as aarti is a perf- aarti is a performance to be beheld similarly kirtan was also a performance to be beheld but it is mahaprabhu primarily who said kirtan is not just a performance to be, be- to be watched it is to be participated in that's why there is responsive kirtans and not just responsive kirtans dancing kirtans bhakti was very much widely there are, there are some saints who would dance in ecstasy but it was rare but mahaprabhu said but let everybody get access to the processes by which bhakti can be experienced in an intense and ecstatic way 
So Mahaprabhu also travelled all over India and he broke down the various caste and other barriers that were there and invited everyone to practice bhakti. So he made the stimuli very widely available. And Srila Prabhupada took it even further. And he made those stimuli available to everyone, practically in every part of the world. Now we have had devotees even going to Antarctica and distributing books over there. And now there are not many people in Antarctica to receive books. But at least, in principle, Prabhupada's mercy has gone to every continent on the planet now. Mahaprabhu's mercy, the, the sources, the stimuli that will reach spiritual, ex, lead to spiritual ecstasy, they being distributed widely, that itself is fortune. And that itself is mercy. But Mahaprabhu does something more than that. He not only gives the stimuli, but Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami, there's three things. His Rupa, his Bhava, <clears throat> and his Karunya. His form, his form was majestically beautiful. He was, a, he was, he was like a golden mountain. He was, he was just a irresistibly attractive to look at. Rupa. And then there was his Bhava. Bhava. He himself was filled with so much ecstasy. And then on top of it is Karunya. It was not just his ecstasy was in relationship with the Lord. Mahap Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that love for God, when it is directed towards the Lord, it is manifested as absorption. That when we are beholding the Lord, we forget everything else. At love for God, when it is manifested towards others, it is manifested as compassion. That is not that when we have to deal with others, we are lost in the Lord. No, we are attentive to help others come closer to Krishna. So his bhava was his absorption in the Lord, when he forgot everything else. But his karunya was when he would travel across the country. Who, anyone he would say, sthana, sthana, na dekhi, na dekhi, patra, patra. He would just embrace everyone. And you would just infuse them with experiences of love for Krishna. And in this way, the, this what we talk about, not only the stimuli, but Mahaprabhu would accelerate the process by which they would get experiences and they would get the impact. They would get just completely transformed. Just forget everything else and just devote their lives to the love for the Lord. So, Mahaprabhu's mercy comes in both things that we get the opportunity for spiritual stimuli and by which we realize there is something of higher value and Mahaprabhu's mercy also comes in the form that in our capacity to actually start valuing the things that are of higher value. And this is, this is, these two have a relationship with each other. I'll conclude with this point and I'll talk about one past time which illustrates this point which I'm making in the last that Mahaprabhu, if we say his life had two distinct phases. In the first phase of his life, he was constantly traveling. Uh, of the first, uh, first phase of his life as a, as a devotee. Mahaprabhu started manifesting his bhakti from the age of 20. And then he was constantly inviting others to participate in Kirtan when he traveled in, across India, North India, South India. That was his, in one sense, his preaching phase. He was doing outreach. And then there's, uh, there was the outreach and we could say then there was the inreach. In the last years of his life, the last 18 years, Mahaprabhu was going deep into his relationship with Krishna. And he was experiencing and demonstrating the ultimate symptoms of ecstasy. There are some transformations of the body, like the, the like say the signs of the crucifixion, something appearing on people's bodies. There are transformations of spiritual ecstasy talked about in various various religious traditions. But the kind of transformation that Mahaprabhu is, would manifest, sometimes in ecstasy, it appeared as if his arms had become so long that they had almost the bones had become disconnected, and they were being held together only by the skin. Now, the Gaudiya commentators explain that why would this kind of transformation happen? And Mahaprabhu would feel separation from Krishna. At that time, he would long for Krishna and then would spread his arms apart, wide, 
and as far as the way could go now depending he's a, he's a janu lambit he was already very long arms were there but still he would feel krishna is so far away and stretching out for krishna what would happen is his arms would become so long that it appears as if they were they were, dis they were disconnected from his body so his limbs would become even longer and longer and sometimes his limbs would shrink into his body and that was when he would experience the presence of krishna at that time he wanted to be so immersed in the experience of krishna that all the senses would feel just like distractions so if i if we want to hear something and then we touch some we put our hand on the ground it's too cold then we move somewhere it's too hot yes, this is annoying i don't want to touch anywhere it's for to focus on hearing so sometimes if our senses are giving us some sensation that are distracting us from what we focus on we just don't want anything to do with the senses so like if we are tasting something delicious and somebody wants to talk with us later as we are going to eat right now just taste something delicious and sometimes it's very delicious we have to close our eyes you know i don't want to see anything just feel the taste of this so like that for mahaprabhu when he would feel the proximity and the presence of krishna he would be in such ecstasy that i don't want to experience anything else and that's how all his limbs would withdraw into his body that no limb should be out causing any distraction so like there's the transformation that mahaprabhu would exhibit are extraordinary and by that also while he was experiencing it himself he was also demonstrating this to others and as demonstrating this to others he was giving them also a spiritual experience so spiritual experiences can come when we ourselves experience krishna but they can also come when we behold someone else experiencing krishna and being extraordinarily transformed so mahaprabhu in the later part of his life it's it might seem that he was not doing any outreach but he was is one form of outreach is to help people understand okay give up your dharma give up your adharma just practice bhakti but it is here this is prema bhakti vadanyata in this particular verse that we discussed it said that vadanyata at one level to give bhakti give the opportunity for practicing bhakti itself is generosity but beyond that to demonstrate prema to demonstrate the ecstasy of love of god that is even greater mercy and this mercy is multiple levels and layers of mercy mahaprabhu demonstrated in the ratha yatra past time so this is a very profound past time and i'll try to describe this briefly to demonstrate how mahaprabhu was uh, mahaprabhu transformed this ratha yatra festival into a festival of the highest devotional ecstasy that was accessible and relishable for everyone So you could say traditionally in the Ratha Yatra festival, there were three elements. There was Jagannath on his, Lord Jagannath on his Rath. Hmm? Then around him we could say there are the devotees, hmm? and then there are the common pious people who also come in thousands. Hmm? The pious people. Now, in one sense, there are three levels of interaction happening between the devotees and the Lord. the devotees are beholding the lord they are relishing the lord's beauty they are in the internal mood of the past time which i'll come to shortly then there is also the reciprocation between the people in general and the lord and there is the reciprocation between the devotees and the people if the devotees are absorbed in krishna in ecstasy then what would happen is people would see that hey this is something special something extraordinary so this was the ratha yatra festival was happening for a very long time and this reciprocation between the lord and the devotees between the common people and the with lord and the common people and the devotees this was always happening and in fact in any 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 devotional festival these three reciprocations are there when I mean, say we have janmashtami or we have ram navmi people come to behold the lord but what makes the special festival special is if they behold devotees who are devoted to the lord who are in ecstasy hey that that's something special you to see that but in mahaprabhu came what happened was what happened was something much much bigger so we have let's put we have we have lord jagannath now of course jagannath baldev subhadra let's put lord jagannath over here lord jagannath is krishna 
and then we have Mahaprabhu. Mm -hmm. Now then we have devotees. And then we have people in general. So now, there are multiple levels of divine reciprocation happening. Now we could say Mahaprabhu at one level is in the role of a devotee. So Mahaprabhu as devotee is reciprocating with Lord Jagannath. But there is much, it's not Mahaprabhu, not just devotee. Actually, Jagannath, Jagannath is Krishna separated from Radharani. Now Krishna, we know the story of how the form of Jagannath manifested. That, when Krishna, in first time it manifested, that when Krishna was, when the, when the Dwarka Vasis wanted to hear about Krishna Leela, and they asked Rohin to speak about it, and Krishna was secretly hearing and Krishna became so absorbed that his eyes opened wide and his limbs shrunk in and then he manifested Jagannath. So Jagannath is Krishna remembering Rajivasis and Rajivasis ultimately is the topmost Rajivasi is Radharani. So it's Krishna remembering Radharani and separated from Radharani. And Mahaprabhu is Radharani separated from Krishna. Mahaprabhu is of course Krishna but Krishna in the mood of Radharani. And Radharani longing for Krishna. Aidina Dayadranathahe Mathuranatha Kadava Lokkese. That, oh Lord, now you are the Lord of the fallen people. You are the Lord of your devotees. But you have left us all and have gone to Mathura. You have become the Mathuranath. Now, what am I going to do? Where am, how am I going to live? So, Mahaprabhu is Radharani in the mood of separation from Krishna. So actually in Rathyatra, it was not just devotees beholding the Lord and rejoicing with the Lord. It was actually the union of Radha and Krishna that was happening. So when Mahaprabhu was dancing and sometimes Jagannath's cart would stop because Jagannath wanted to behold, Jagannath is Krishna wanting to behold Radharani. And so this is the ultimate culmination of Rasa Leela that happened. Rasa Leela, there is the whole pastime where they where they come together, talk, then Krishna disappear, then they come again together, they dance. It's extraordinarily past. The culmination of that is the union of Radha and Krishna. So that's what's happening in, Rast in, the, in the Jagannath festival also. Now, while Mahaprabhu is, the, is in the mood of Radharani, for Jagannath, for devotees, Mahaprabhu is their Lord. So here, between devotees and Mahaprabhu, there is another reciprocation. This is for, the, for him, it is, Chaitanya Chaitanya says that there was, there was, there were two divines over there. There was the moving Lord and the non-moving Lord. Moving, non-moving means, there was Jagannath who was not manifestedly moving and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was moving. So, for them, now the, the earlier interactions, I said they were always there. Hmm? These interactions there, but this was, the devotees were beholding Mahaprabhu. And when they're beholding Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu would frequently go into ecstasy. But the kind of ecstasy would be there in, in the Jagannatha Tiyatra would be unparalleled. And they would be thrilled. They would be, ex they would be amazed. And generally, Mahaprabhu's ecstasies were exhibited in private. Either at night when he was all alone with Sarod Damodar or Shankar Pandit or somebody like that, he would exhibit his ecstasies. But at the time of Ratyatra, his ecstasies were exhibited for everyone to see. So because of that, even ordinary people got the dis exhibition of, got the demonstration, got the darshan of Mahaprabhu in that mood of ecstasy. So Mahaprabhu, in one sense, the devotees who were already dedicated to the practice of bhakti, he was giving them the experience of prema, the highest ecstasy. And for those who were just pious, he was showing them the ecstasy of love of God and he was increasing their faith. He was elevating them higher. And of course, the other interaction with people and devotees was also there. But in this way, Mahaprabhu was both experiencing Krishna, and he was savoring Krishna, and he was sharing Krishna. He was sharing Krishna with the devotees. He was sharing Krishna with the pious people in general. And in this way he was elevating everyone. 
I could speak much more about this past time. But the point is that there are, there are multiple levels of loving reciprocation that were happening. And it was not that Mahaprabhu was just in his own world not caring for everyone else. At that time, during Mahaprabhu's time, historians of Bengal and of Indian religion say that the Ratyatra festival attained heights like never before during Mahaprabhu's time. During those 17, 18 years when Mahaprabhu was there, that time the Ratyatra, th thousands and thousands and millions and millions of people would come and they would behold Mahaprabhu and they would become spiritually inspired by that. And that same ecstasy, Shri Prabhupada, in the Antarila of Jachatan Charitamrit, when he speaks about, when Mahaprabhu is experiencing ecstasy, and he's talking about the mood of separation from Radharani, of, of Radharani's separation from Krishna, and longing for Krishna, and Prabhupada writes in the purports that the way to enter Radha Krishna's pastimes is by spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world. Now, some people say, hey, this is, this is, this is Rasavas, what is going on? Here there are intimate parts of Radha and Krishna and then we are supposed to go and tell people you are not the body or the soul. You know, where is the Rasa over here? Actually, the Rasa is in pleasing Krishna. It is not that Mahaprabhu was experiencing ecstasy because he was with Krishna. Yes, it was with Krishna, but Mahaprabhu experienced ecstasy because he was pleasing Krishna. And Prabhupada took that responsibility. So somebody may say, I have faith in Mahaprabhu. He is Krishna. Yeah, that's wonderful. But if he's Krishna, then his prophecy is going to come true. And a devotee may say, Yeah, he's his God, his prophecy is going to come true. Prabhupada says, and Krishna did not tell Arjuna. Arjuna did not tell Krishna. Krishna, you told me you're God. So now you only win this war. I'll just sit and relax. No, Krishna, Arjuna said, I will do your will. So like that Prabhupada, he knew Krishna, Mahaprabhu is God. But Prabhupada took the responsibility of sharing, of sharing Mahaprabhu's legacy, of fulfilling Mahaprabhu's desire. Prutvite yacheta nagaradi gram sarvatra pachar hoi bimoranam. That my name will be chanted in every town and play, village in the world. When Mahaprabhu came to Varanasi, he said, I brought, Kashi, he said, I brought so many fruits of love of God, but there's nobody to take them. But nobody is buying them, so I'll give them free. But I have so many fruits that I cannot even give them free. So please assist me in giving these fruits of love of God. Oh, that is Vadanyata. So Prabhupada took that responsibility of distributing the fruits of love of God. And for us, we may or may not experience ecstasy when we take darshan or when we do puja. Uh, and yes, we will also experience ecstasy at times and those times will also increase as we keep practicing bhakti. But for us, if we try to share Krishna bhakti with others, then therein we will see wonderful things happening. Wonderful things happening and how people become transformed by their contact with Krishna. Wonderful things happening in our own hearts, how we feel inspired, how we become enriched. And that is also an experience of Krishna. So, from where we are, we want to rise higher. And Prabhupada is saying that the way we rise higher is by learning to value Krishna enough to want to share Krishna with others. And when we do that, we will reach out. Not only outward to people and give them Krishna, but we also reach inward to Krishna and connect more and more with Him. So this is the mercy of Mahaprabhu which Prabhupada has given and which we all can ourselves relish and we can also distribute to others. So I'll summarize. I spoke broadly three main points today. The first point I spoke was about mercy as, as elevating our values, our understanding of what is of values. So <clears throat> we all value certain things in life. And Mahaprabhu described that those who have no goal, he becomes their goal. Those who already have goals, he becomes their highest goal. So this change in our values, it takes time. Slowly rising our value. Every impurity means it misaligns what we value with what is of actual value. And purification means that realignment happens. So this is incremental process like a climbing up a staircase. 
but by mahaprabhu's mercy it can elevator we can rapidly what we value can change and align with what is of value and the second part i discussed was about spiritual experiences so spiritual experiences basically this change of values it can happen either through intelligence where we philosophically understand and through experiencing krishna through the practice of bhakti now with respect to spiritual experiences that what actually happens within it's unknown nobody else can know and people can claim what they want but what we can look at is the impact the impact should be that a person who has had a spiritual experience should be valuing krishna more than anything else and the way we can seek that experiences by valuing the stimuli and exposing ourselves to the stimuli in a disciplined regular way now now mahaprabhu you could say first level of mercy is that he gives us access to the stimuli itself mahaprabhu transform kirtan from a performance to a participation prabhupad gave the opportunity for kirtan to everyone all over the world so access to the stimuli itself if you consider the spiritual experience there is the stimuli and there is the impact and by mahaprabhu's mercy the impact also becomes faster that happens by his rupa his bhava and his karunya by his beauty by his ecstasy and by his magnanimity and the last part we discussed is that how this reciprocation of love between the lord and the devotees that can happen at many 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 different ways at different places so the rath yatra there was mahaprabhu reciprocating with the lord mahaprabhu reciprocating with devotees and mahaprabhu also reciprocating with the people in general apart from the devotees reciprocating with the lord people reciprocating with the lord and devotees reciprocating with people so for us the way we connect with the lord more deeply that we we see we of course practice bhakti and we connect with krishna deeply but when we try to connect others with krishna when we try to share mahaprabhu's mercy with others as shri prabhupad did so tirelessly and so fearlessly even in his old age then the more we try to do outreach the more krishna himself will do in reach krishna will reach out to us and then we will experience the transformation by which what we value will start aligning with what is of ultimate value and that is the mercy of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments yes mata ji we have mic yeah Hare Krishna thank you so much for the class prabhu ji um i was wondering if you could explain how offenses block our ability to see what is of highest value okay how do offenses block our capacity to see what is of highest value see in general an offense itself is an indication in general offense itself is an indication that we are devaluing something of value that means see that's generally if we are ignorant then it is it is said that we are not offensive that's why there is there is uh, naam aparad the offense to the holy name of occurs when somebody knows the glory of the holy name and neglects it but if we don't know about the glory of the holy name and then we chant it in a in a tentative or a in a disrespectful way that's not considered an offense so generally when we know something is of value and we devalue it in spite of that knowledge that is when it's an offense and then krishna says despite knowing is you don't value it then i will take away your appreciation of its value so that's why what happens is when krishna takes away that appreciation of its value it could be an the intelligence can be lost or just the taste can be lost and when that happens then it's almost like a free fall that we just fall from wherever whatever elevated state we might have been before to what are wherever our conditionings would have kept us in the past so basically our sense of valuation if we devalue if we we devalue something of value then krishna will take away that sense of sense of value itself for us that appreciation of its value both in terms of our intelligence and our taste and that's how that offenses in that sense uh quite dangerous please answer your question thank you any other questions yes please 
Hi, Krishna. Yesterday, in Buddha Bhavana's uh, purpose class, he actually also mentioned value, and he said that value is synonymous to faith. Can you comment on this and how it's relating to what you are speaking today? Okay, value is synonymous to faith. Yes, we could say that faith is uh, basically our value system. Shraddha mayoyam purusho yeyach shraddha sa eva saha. That Krishna says that we are all made of our faith. Shraddha mayoyam purusho. In the 17th chapter, Krishna says that what constitutes, what defines a person is their faith. Sometimes we use the anand mayo abhyasa. The soul is filled with joy. But here Krishna is saying that is true. But here anand, here says shraddha mayoyam purusho. That we are actually made of faith. What that means is that our faith determines the choices that we will make. Our faith determines the kind of goals we will pursue. So it's just, uh, if I have faith that, uh, if I have faith in money, then to earn money I will go to any extreme. Mm -hmm. If I have faith in, some people say, say, in the communist rule, people had great faith in the government. That the government had become the substitute for God for people. So for the sake of the government, people were even ready to betray their family members. Betray their, you know, it is said that every third person was a, like a Soviet spy. So you speak one thing against the government, somebody in your family might be an informer to the government. So what would that mean? Their faith in the government was greater than their faith in the family. So basically, faith is very much associated with our values. Uh, now, in one sense, now when we talk about values, there could be like a rational values. Rational means rationally I understand this is important. But faith is it's almost like a not non-rational, but a trans-rational trans value system. That is, I don't need any reason to consider this to be important. Now there are some things which we will never do. Even if somebody gives you a rational explanation, that's all right. Why, why don't you do it? You know, there is a, there's an increasing propaganda now in Europe that people should start taking, eating insects. Like now there are, there, it's actually, they say insects are very eco-friendly. Well, it's definitely not friendly for the insects <laughs> themselves. <laughs> they are going to die. But bread and pasta and all this is made using ground insects. Now, now there is most people, they revolted the idea. I can't eat insects. But what? There is a paper published in, in a prominent scientific journal. How to persuade people to start eating insects. Now, now we may say that, okay, there is, there is, a, there is, there is some eco-friendly value, this, that, there are so many proteins in this, proteins in that. So many. Prabhupada said, even human refuse has nutrition. But that doesn't mean you're going to eat human refuse. Isn't it? There, there are certain things we don't need a reason to say no to. No, I'm not going to do it. So, now that, that is not irrational. It, some things could be irrational, but there is something, we all have certain boundaries we will not violate. That is, so faith is about that valuation which is transrational. So, it's, I value certain things even if I can't with reason explain why this is so important for me. So, faith, faith is like a transnational values. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Ch Ch Chanchar and Prabhu, for this wonderful class. Uh, I would like to share my experience here in this wonderful movement, ISKCON movement. I found something which is, I might say, that is more merciful than the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. is mercy of devotees. Mm -hmm. And I can say that sometimes I come to this temple room and I see lots of people they're standing while it's curtain is going and they're not joining them even here is in temple but uh, when we s have a chance to uh, serve a devotee we receive this uh, mercy from from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from Prabhupada and it's amazing uh, that's what I would like to say that mercy of serving for those who want, who experience this uh, mercy from Chaitanya Prabhu 
even more merciful, you know, it's who is making this impact in this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this world. So thank yes. you. Sorry if we heard. Yes, definitely. He said that, you know, Mahaprabhu spread Krishna consciousness in Bengal and Orissa and South India. Prabhupada spread all over the world. And without that Prabhupada is greater than Mahaprabhu. But by Mahaprabhu's mercy, he wants his devotees to be glorified. So yes, Krishna's mercy, Mahaprabhu's mercy often becomes more accessible through his devotees. Thank you. Yes, please. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Thank you very much for the enlightening talk. Uh, is it, um, I would like to ask you whether to see others' good qualities and to focus on one's own bad qualities is recommended to invoke, to be recipient for the mercy of the Lord. Okay, is it, rec rec is it recommended to focus on others' good qualities and our bad qualities to receive mercy? Well, it depends. The principle is amanina manadena, that we should respect others. And respecting others means looking at their good qualities. And amani means not that we start disrespecting ourselves. It's that, uh, it's that we don't, we are not constantly craving for respect. So now we all have, everybody has some good qualities, some bad qualities. And that includes we and others. So generally looking at others' good qualities is very good. And that, is, that will help us to respect them. Now, with respect to ourselves, it depends on our state of mind. So, generally, we think that we often think that the opposite of opposite of humility is ego. So, if I want to avoid ego, then I will. Ego means to think how great I am, and I want to be humble, so I'll avoid ego. But actually, rather than thinking of these as two things. The opposite of ego is not humility, it is insecurity, it is inferiority. Hmm? And these two, ego is to think I am far bigger than I am, what I actually am. And insecurity is to think I am far smaller than what I am. Ego means to think I am everything, I can do everything. Insecurity means I am nothing, I can do nothing. But in between these two, the balance of the pendulum is humility. That I am something, I am a part of Krishna and I can do some things. I can play my part in Krishna's plan. So, when we dwell on our bad qualities, if we are in this direction of, if, if, if our inner self-conception is, is going towards the ego side, then to bring it here, it's uh, contemplate our negatives. Contemplate our bad qualities, our deficiencies. You know, people may think I am so great, but you know, I can't, I can't do this. I can't control my senses. I can't do this. I can't do that. That will bring, that will keep us humble. But if we are going towards insecurity, we are feeling worthless. We are feeling what is the? We are feeling hopeless. We are becoming so disheartened that we just don't feel like practicing bhakti. Feel like doing anything in life. Then, if we are going this direction, we have to contemplate our good qualities. Not in the sense of being self-congratulatory, but in the sense that you know, Krishna values me, Krishna has given me some gifts also. And I can use them in Krishna's service. There's, and Prabhupada also in his different letters exhibits these different things. One time one devotee wrote to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I want to assist you in saving fallen souls all over the world. And Prabhupada wrote back, you know, First, one should save oneself. <laughs> I don't think that, you know, that if I go to save the whole world. First, say, so if somebody is having a too high self-conception, bring it down a little bit. First, save yourself. And, uh, another devotee wrote a letter, Prabhupada, I am such a fallen soul. What can I do in your glorious mission? And Prabhupada wrote back, I need many fallen souls like you to save the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> so, Prabhupada is appreciating that, <laughs> appreciating that devotee. So, it depends on our state of mind. See, it's like, sometimes it's good to look at ourselves the way we would look at somebody we care for. Hmm? It's look at ourselves from a third person perspective. So, if somebody has come to us and they are just, they are just putting on air, they are bloated, they are egoistic, 
then it may be our duty as their guides, as their friends to bring them a notch down. But if they're already discouraged, then that is not the time we have to teach them humility. It's the time we have to give them encouragement, we have to boost their morale. So it depends. Sometimes our limitations, our deficiencies, our bad qualities, contemplating them can be helpful. But the point is not so much whether I'm contemplating my good qualities or contemplating my bad qualities. The key point is whether I'm contemplating Krishna and my service to Krishna. And for my service to Krishna, sometimes remembering my good qualities can be helpful. And sometimes remembering my limitations can be helpful. So if we focus on Krishna, then focus on service to Krishna, then we can have a healthy, appropriate relationship with ourselves. Okay? okay um, Prabhuji, um, is it okay to ask one more question? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, you kindly said, offenses block mercy. Please forgive me for asking second question. Uh, so if offenses block mercy, how can we nullify, sins can be nullified by devotional services, but how can we nullify offenses? See, ultimately, Krishna doesn't want to keep us away from him. Krishna wants to, uh, wants us to give up the things that keep us away from him. So if offense is essentially <coughs> devaluing something of value, then the way to correct offense is to start revaluing it. That's why if I've offended a devotee, we go and seek forgiveness from that devotee. So what is that? it's not just an external act of forgiveness that is important. What is that? I devalued you. I'm sorry, I'm not going to devalue you anymore. I value you enough and that's why I'm seeking forgiveness from you. So if, if Krishna sees that we have started valuing what is of value, at least according to our level of realization, then Krishna won't uh, keep us against, uh, keep, hold our past offenses against him. So generally it begins with seeking forgiveness from whichever manifestation of Krishna that we have devalued. If it's a devotee, we, we, we seek forgiveness from the devotees. But we shouldn't worry too much about offenses. Because it's like one devotee, I had gone to one place and he said that, you know, he's, he used to come for classes, and he used to sit right in front, front and he would hear the class. And I was there for three, four days, I guess six, seven classes, I didn't come for a single class. Then I messaged him and he said, bro, I cannot come for any class, but I can come and meet you if you want. I said, okay, sure, please come. He says, what happened? Why are you not coming for any class? I know anything, you lost interest in bhakti or what happened? He says, no, no, bhakti is very important. He said, then what happened? He says, I came, yes, before you came, there was some devotee who gave a class on how dangerous Vaishnava Aparad is. So I thought that in order to avoid Vaishnava Aparad, I'll stop going in the association of Vaishnava only. <laughs> 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 then I will never commit any offense. <laughs> no, that is, I told him, that's like, suppose, somebody hears some talk about how dangerous food poisoning is. And their solution is, I'll stop eating food only. <laughs> that's not the solution. We have to be careful of the food we eat. Not that we stop eating food. So sometimes what happens is if one point is emphasized too much, don't commit offenses, don't commit offenses, they're so dangerous. So we might make that avoiding offense the most important thing in our spiritual life. You know, our most important thing in spiritual life is connecting with Krishna, serving Krishna. And for that association of devotees is important. So Krishna is not going to hold some incidental offenses against us. The real serious offenses are where we knowingly, intentionally devalue a devotee. If if somebody is, you know, sometimes we, we displease someone, we hurt someone incidentally, circumstantially, because of our limitations, that's okay. But knowingly, we malign someone, we try to pull someone down, we try to spread rumors about someone. That is where, that is a serious offenses. Okay? Thank you. Okay, last question. Prabhu. Let's talk about this. Prabhu, Hare Krishna Prabhu, Prabhu. thanks yes. so much for the great class. Um, I was just wondering about something. So you were mentioning about um, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was uh, displaying ecstatic symptoms, sometimes he was longing out, reaching out uh, for Krishna, and sometimes he was experiencing Krishna within himself. So I was just wondering, a lot of times um, we hear, like we have that mood of uh, longing out for Krishna, wanting to connect with Krishna uh, outside. And we see that a lot of times in our, in the acharyas as well. But we don't we don't really put much emphasis on experiencing Krishna within ourselves, seated right within us. So I was wondering if that's something we can also meditate on, um, 
also maybe in our job or something like that. Um, yeah, what's your thoughts on that? So experiencing Krishna within us, we don't emphasize that too much. Yeah, it's oftentimes it's, it's more like a longing and reaching out to uh, reach out to Krishna rather than experiencing Krishna well, right within us. It's a it's not necessarily reaching out is only in a like a physical sense. And sometimes people say that heaven is up. Mm -hmm. But people all over the earth say heaven is up. Now, in India, people say heaven is up. In America, people say heaven is up. If you look at the earth is circular. So heaven is up, heaven is up. Where is up? <laughs> is it? it? <laughs> so that up is not a geographical up. Mm -hmm. It's more of a consciousness-wise up. Mm -hmm. So the spiritual world exists at a higher level, not just of a higher uh, level of physical reality, but a higher level of consciousness. So when you're talking about reaching out to Krishna, it is not just outward, it can also be inward. Inward Krishna is there close to us, but still we are not perceiving him, so he's far away from us. So actually, it is Krishna's external manifestations that remind us of Krishna, that reconnect us with Krishna. And the more we expose ourselves to Krishna's external manifestations, the more we start becoming aware of his presence inside us also. Now broadly, there are three ways in which we connect with Krishna. Or, or Traditionally, or it is not Krishna, people have sought God in three broad ways. One is the religious ways where people focus on worship and uh, practices by which they focus on the external manifestations of the Lord. Then there is the, the psychological or internal meditational way where people focus on meditation and they try to turn inwards. And there is the cosmic or the natural way where people go close to nature, focus on the universe. And then in, that is the, that, that manifestation is talked about in the universal form of God. Universal form is the second kind of Bhagavatam talks about. So all three are ways which are included in the Bhagavatam. Now, we primarily approach Krishna through the Bhakti way, but we can see Krishna in nature also. When Prabhupada would go on morning walks, he would talk about seeing Krishna there. We also see. If, so if we, if we personally are inclined to focus on Krishna in our hearts, not at the expense of our normal Bhakti practice which connect with Krishna externally, but some people may be more introspective and they can focus on that also. That's also wonderful. Okay. So thank you very much. Yes. So... Now this is uh, Shichitani Charitamrut uh, marathon is going on all over the world this time and devotees are distributing lots of books of the entire Chaitanya Charitamrut set and Chaitanya Charitamrut is a literature that is not so well known but that is an opportunity for us to distribute because we distribute Bhagavad Gita many people already say I have Bhagavad Gita but if you try to distribute Chaitanya Charitamrut not many people are going to say I already have Chaitanya Charitamrut. So that's an advantage for us and it's an extraordinary treasure of literature, of devotion, of art. So on the occasion of Mahaprabhu's appearance day, it's a, if, if you don't have CC, you can have it, you can distribute it to your friends, gift it or inspire them to take it. That's a great opportunity to uh, share the mercy of Mahaprabhu far and wide through distributing the Chaitanya Charita Amrath. Would you like to talk about it? Hare Krishna. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu Ki. So just, just to let you know, uh, Prabhu is a prolific writer and he's written many wonderful books. So if anyone wants copies of his uh, books that he's published, we have a book table outside. But before you go, importantly, I'd also like to make an announcement. All of us that are sitting in this room today, we are followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we are recipients of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, with Gaur Punima coming up, many of us are thinking, how can we show and demonstrate our love for Srila Prabhupada, for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Srila Prabhupada gave a very, a very nice answer to this question. He asked the question, what is the symptom of love? What is the most important symptom? Hmm? What is the primary symptom? And Prabhupada said, the most important symptom of love is that the devotee wants to see the glories of his Lord spread far and wide. So the glories of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu um, are, are great. Anyone who comes in contact with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then their life becomes perfect. We've had over a thousand sets of Sri Chaitanya Charita sitting in our warehouse now for years. We've been chipping away, distributing some but for a follower of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to be sitting here 
and have thousands of sets sitting in a warehouse not distributed is a great travesty. We can't allow that to happen. So we want to make a proposal to all of the devotees, at least those ones sitting in the room here today, and those who are watching online, for this upcoming Gaur Punima festival, please take a set of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. If you don't want have one, keep it for yourself. If you have one, then sponsor one, distribute one. Uh, it's only 79 pounds for UK, and for sponsoring a set in India is 49 pounds. You can go to krishnatemple.com backslash cc set or UK purchase and sponsorship and krishnatemple.com backslash cc for sponsorship in India. Once one devotee came to Srila Prabhupada and he said he wants to distribute Bengali sweets in the university. And Prabhupada said, we're not interested, interested in distributing that Bengali sweet. The real Bengali sweet is Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita. <laughs> so let's distribute the real Bengali sweet, Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita. Dear devotees, we have a table outside there. We have many sets. We have languages, Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Gujarati, Bengali. Many, many languages we have, and English. Uh, it's accessible. Whoever takes a set gets the full audio book, gets the Chaitanya Charita Amrita compact e-book. You get a nice wooden carved uh, set of Lord Nityananda's lotus feet. So as many gifts we are giving away for those who take and sponsor, please become part of this effort. Uh, many of you have this reservation that Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita is, is not for everyone. When Srila Prabhupada first published the Chaitanya Charita Amrita, in a matter of 18 months, he, he translated and gave purports to the 11,500 verses. And the devotees asked Srila Prabhupada, how many copies shall we print? And they were thinking, okay, maybe Prabhupada will say 5,000 sets. Prabhupada said, 50,000 sets. And the devotee said, Prabhupada, 50,000 sets, there's not so many devotees. And Prabhupada said, you distribute on the streets the entire set of Chaitanya Charita Amrita. So don't have this reservation that Chaitanya Charita Amrita is only for some devotees. This is meant for everyone. And Srila Prabhupada confirmed that. So please, dear devotees, as part of Gaur Punima Festival, become part of this effort to distribute as many, many sets. And in the least, take one set home with you today. Keep it in your lounge. And Prabhupada says, simply by doing that, simply by thinking how to do, how to do, how to do, we become liberated. Simply by thinking how to do. So take the set, and from the time you take that set, your mind will be thinking how to do, how to do, how to do. We have some wonderful presentations, some wonderful videos which you can share to your contacts via social media. Come and see us, and we'll give you all of the material you need to promote Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Oh. I just wrote a few of you. I'll not refuse. Somewhere very special. Oh, okay.